Welcome, friends, to Voice of Assurance, the MP3 edition. I'm Dr. Tom Kakuza, pastor of Northland Bible Baptist Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The purpose of Voice of Assurance is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to equip believers through verse-by-verse -verse preaching and topical message. Now, while there's no substitute for individual participation in a sound local church, I trust these messages will augment your spiritual growth and be a blessing to you. Let's go ahead now to the message. John chapter 2, John chapter 2, six empty water pots. You know, when we come to John chapter 2, it's a shame in the alcoholic drenched society in which we live today that the only thing on most people's minds in John 2 is uh, the issue of the wine. Was it alcoholic? Was it not alcoholic? Well, we're gonna, we'll look at that today, but that's really not the main thing in the text. Most people really miss what the Lord is trying to get across in the text here. In John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, of course, this is the first miracle, as we see in verse 11, uh, this beginning of the miracles. This was the first miracle that the Lord Jesus, uh, that we have recorded here in, in the Bible. There was the marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And of course, uh, it's always a good idea to invite Jesus to a wedding when two people are getting married. Uh, see, it is God who ordained marriage to begin with. And to have a wedding without the Lord involved, quote unquote, is simply a ridiculous thing to do, seeing he is the one who designed it. He is the one who instituted marriage in the first place. If the Lord Jesus Christ is not welcome at a marriage, then the two people really should not get married. The Lord Jesus Christ is God, and God is the one who instituted marriage. And so to invite the Lord to a marriage is a very appropriate thing. He is to be the center of every marriage. And if the Lord is truly the center of a marriage, the marriage will be blessed because it will be a marriage that honors him and he will honor that union if they will seek to honor him. Verse three, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Several things in these verses. Now, many people have taken verse four to mean that the Lord Jesus Christ showed some sort of a disrespect for his mother because in our society today, when a man looks at a woman and he says, woman, like this, it's kind of like a, kind of like almost like a pushy kind of thing. But this is a different time and place, folks. And, and in the culture of the time, the word woman, when it was used in this way, was a term of respect. It was a term of respect, unlike in, in the days in which we live. Of course, Jesus was God. He would have never disrespected his earthly mother. When he was hanging on the cross, he said, uh, he talked and, and he said, woman, and he recognized his, his mother as woman and called her such. He was saying, what is he saying here? Well, I believe he was saying that the problem was not really their concern, that there was no wine or uh, juice here to, to drink at this wedding. He says, my hour has not yet come, meaning that the time for him to fulfill his purpose, which I believe is the work of salvation, had not yet arrived. Now, Jesus, all the way through his ministry, if you follow the life of Jesus through the Gospels, you'll notice that at times, okay, they wanted to do this to him. But what did he do? He slipped out. He got away. Uh, certain times he would deal with demons, and of course, they would confess them, and he would, and he would, he would basically want to, want to, uh, uh, or in, when miracles would be worked, he would tell them, listen, don't tell anybody about this. Don't go noising this abroad. Uh, why? Because he had a time frame in his mind. He had a, he had a way of fulfilling his plan. Well, his, his time was not yet in the sense of the main issues of his ministry. Now, he does go ahead here and uh, produce a miracle, which is truly a miracle, which, you know, was his will to do, and he did it. But he said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. She wanted him to uh, do a miracle. And he says, you know, it's not really my concern. My hour is not yet come. Obviously, though, he went ahead and did one anyway. Verse 5, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And you know, Mary 
She's a very wise woman, very wise woman. How would she have talked to him? Have you ever thought about that? She knew who he was. Would she refer to him in son or would she say Lord? Isn't that kind of interesting? What does she say here? She looks at the men, she says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. That's kind of the end of it there for her. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. I think she had some hopes here, but she was surrendered to the will of the Son of God. And there were there, set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, firkin is about nine gallons. We're talking about 18 to 27 uh, gallons each here. Verse 7, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. So he says, Fill them with water. And then he turns right around. He says, Okay, now you go ahead and you, you let them have some of this. Verse 9, When the ruler of the feast, and I want you to notice the next two words, had tasted, I'd say, What's the big deal there? We're going to get back to that in just a minute. But you, you mark it down, maybe underline it in the Bible, because we're going to be discussing in just a second the issue of, well, what's wrong with drinking? Jesus turned the water into wine, and therefore, you know, we can go chug a lug, Mogan David, and, and all these things, because Jesus put his okay on it back in John chapter 2. Well, let's look at it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. He didn't know where it came from, but the servants knew because they were there when Jesus did it. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men, when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. In other words, you put your best out first, and then after a while, you, you bring out, you know, the stuff maybe isn't the highest quality. Now, now, you know, in the days in which we live, folks, as an example, we'll just talk about punch for a minute. And uh, when we have a, an event here, you know, because of the way things are produced commercially, we can pretty much keep the consistency, right, of the product. But not so in those times. They didn't have big factories where they produced products. And so uh, what you'd have is you would, you would know that because with grapes, obviously not all grapes were consistent and always the same. You would put your best out for your guests because you always want to give your best to your guests. So this was, this was the issue and uh, this was noticed. Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now, I want you to notice something back in verse 9. The issue here in verse 9 was not, whoa, boy, is that powerful. The issue was what in verse 9? Remember those words? Taste. Taste. It was an issue of flavor, not an issue of fermentation. Nowhere in it does it say it was an issue of fermentation. It says it was an issue of flavor. When they had tasted, this tastes better. This really tastes good, is what he's saying. Verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now I want to cover two issues today. One of them has to do with this issue of the wine, and the other really has to do with the thrust of the passage, what the Lord is, is wanting us to get at. The one question, did Jesus turn this water into alcoholic wine? That's a legitimate question. It's a fair question, and when you go verse by verse through Scripture, you can't escape dealing with it, so let's just dig right in and look at this. I personally do not believe he did, and we're going to talk about why here this morning, okay? Number one, the word for wine can either mean fermented or not fermented. It can either mean alcoholic or not alcoholic. As I said, they did not have big factories back there. They did not have wineries, so to speak. This was not the way it was back then. And the fruit of the vine, uh, wine could either be alcoholic or not 
alcoholic. Dr. Henry Morris, the late doctor, or may I say the distinguished late Dr. Henry Morris, founder of Institute for Creation Research, along with Martin E. Clark, in the book, The Bible Has the Answer, has some very interesting talk. Now, Dr. Henry Morris, uh, was a great scientist. He was a science man, okay? He was a giant in science and taught for many years at Virginia Tech and uh, had a great deal to teach and, of course, was, was basically what many would consider the, the father of modern biblical creationism. And uh, he says this in, in the book, Quote, the, quote, pure blood of the grape, unquote, Deuteronomy 32, 14, is in itself not only harmless, but sweet and healthful. It is only after the grape sugar, through the fermentation process, caused by the yeast bacteria that collect on the grape skins, is broken down into alcohol and carbon dioxide, that the wine becomes harmful. Fermentation is essentially a decay process in which the complex sugar molecules are caused to break down into the simpler molecules of alcohol. At body temperature, sugar taken into the system is inhibited from this type of decay and instead is a primary source of energy for the body's activities. Alcohol, on the other hand, is itself a cause of bodily decay, entering the bloodstream undigested and thence attacking the nervous system and the entire bodily structure, causing damage everywhere it goes and eventually, if enough is ingested, death. And we know, what is he saying? There are people who literally drink themselves to death and they drink alcohol, alcoholic beverages. In the old, he goes on, in the Old Testament, two Hebrew words, tirash and yayin, are both translated wine in the, form, uh, the former meaning the fresh juice of the grape and the latter the fermented or decayed juice. However, in the Greek language, the same word oinos was used for both. That is, the term wine in the New Testament can mean either the fresh fruit of the vine or its decayed product, as the context may require, which I've said for years. A parallel usage in modern English would be our use of the word cider, to refer either to sweet cider or to hard cider, as the context may indicate. There is an abundance of both ancient Hebrew and Greek secular literature available to verify that both fermented and unfermented quote-unquote wines were in common use by the people of that day. So the word for wine can either mean fermented or un fermented, which leads us to our second point. Fermentation is a result of man's sin in that the fall of man brought decay into the universe. In other words, folks, it was never God's plan to have fermented wine, but fermentation is simply the process of decay. It's no different that if you keep a piece of meat in your refrigerator too long, it's going to look pretty gross in a certain period of time. Why? Was the meat bad? No, but over time it decays. It's, it's just the way it is. It's a curse on creation. Uh, hold your place here and look at Genesis chapter 3. Fermentation is a result of the fall. In other words, before the fall, there were grapes, but the grapes never fermented. Once the fall took place and sin entered the world, then fermentation came along with that because fermentation is a breakdown and it's because of the curse on creation. Genesis 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. You notice, cursed is the ground. Because of the fall, death came into creation. Because of the fall, because of sin, Death came into creation and a curse on the earth. Now go with me to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look together at verse 22. Romans 8, verse 22. It says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Why? Because of the fall of man. Because when sin entered into the world, death came through sin. Now, I want you to think about something. Go back to John chapter 2. Here we have, the, here we have the, um, the feast. Here we have the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the creator of all things. 
I got a question for you. Why would the Lord create something brand new in a decayed state? You see what I'm getting at? Fermentation is a result of the breakdown. Basically, it's spoiling. It's going bad, so to speak. Why would the Lord make something brand new? Do we, do we really think that he would create something spoiled? God, the author of life, he would create something in a decayed state? Folks, I don't think so. I think when Jesus created this wine, this grape juice is what it was, he created it, and I believe it was the best tasting they had ever had. Why? Because the creator himself made it. Not only that, he had just made it so it did not have time to ferment because it was brand new. No wine, quote unquote, when it is brand new, is fermented. That takes time. If it had just been created, it wouldn't have had time to decay and to ferment, which leads us to number three. Why would the living word of God, which is what Jesus is and who Jesus is, why would the living word of God create something that would be contradictory to the written word of God? What am I getting at? Well, let me show you some scriptures here. Hold your place in John 2. Go with me over to Proverbs chapter 20. And it says this in Proverbs chapter 20, verse one. It says, look at it. It says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Some new translations put, produces brawling. There's the old term, the, a barroom what? Brawl. That's what it's talking about. Wine is a mocker. It makes a mockery of the things of God. Strong drink is raging, produces brawling, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, this is the written word of God. Why would Jesus create something that would encourage people to go this route? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever in light of Scripture. Look at chapter 23 of Proverbs. Proverbs 23, verse 19. It says this, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Hear, son, in other words, be teachable, listen to what I have to say, be wise, that's what God has called us to be as Christians, and guide thy heart in the way. What is the way? The word of God. Now look at verse 20 in contrast to that. Be not among wine bibbers. Don't run around with people who are involved in that. Among riotous eaters of the flesh, verse 21, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Well, I don't believe in getting drunk. I just believe in social drinking. Why? Why? Friend, if you need alcohol to make you happy, you have a spiritual problem. You have a spiritual problem. You shouldn't need that to make you happy. The Lord will give you something better. The joy of the Lord is better than the worldly happiness. Why would the Lord encourage people in this direction by giving them alcohol when he had already given us a warning about this very thing in his word? Remember, Jesus is the living word. The Bible is the written word. Why would he do something, create something that would contradict the very things he had already written centuries before? Let's go to Proverbs 23. We're here. Look at verse 29. We're going down the page. It says this. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Boy, that sounds like a good life. Who hath babbling? You ever seen some people who are drunk? They say things that are terrible. And then once they're sober, they say, well, you know what? I said that when I was drunk. I should have never said it. But well, friend, who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? How'd you get that? Oh, I passed out and I smashed my head against the cement or against the wall or against the table. Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou, now here you go. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. In other words, you can have it and you'll see these people with the wine glass and it just kind of smoothly swirls around. At last, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. There's enough strange woman without having to do this. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. 
Many times, seemingly normal people, they get drunk, and out of their mouth comes some of the most foul, corrupt things you've ever heard. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Boy, your head's spinning, basically, is what it is. It's a pretty good description. It's, they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. They just get numb. They're so drunk, they're numb. When shall I awake? What a sad statement. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Friend, let me ask you a question. Why in the world would Jesus create something where he has said in his word that you shouldn't partake of? Why would he do it? It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No, the issue in John chapter 2 was the flavor of the grape juice, not the alcoholic content. Jesus would not contradict himself. God does not contradict himself. And, and we have very clear warnings here in Proverbs about not fooling around with it. You might say, well, it's talking about don't get drunk on it. No, he said don't touch it when it's in that state. Didn't he say that? That's what he says in verse 31. Don't touch it when it's in an alcoholic state. You know, you'll never become an alcoholic if you don't drink alcohol. Think about it. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's enough. That nails it down. Let's go to the text. Go back to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. The, this is the other issue I would like to touch on today because there is a lesson to be learned from this passage. You see, here is Jesus. Jesus comes to the wedding with his disciples. His, his mom is there. She was invited too. And of course, they did not have, as we have seen, they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus said, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, whatever he says, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. I want you to see two spiritual applications in our text today. The first is this, only God can create something out of nothing. Only God can create something out of nothing. While there was water, there was no juice before he created it. Now, this written record, again, what does it do? It reminds us of his deity. Only God can create something out of nothing. What's it say over in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Only God can create something out of nothing. This points to his deity. Again, it points to his deity. But secondly, the word of God gives us in this passage an illustration of what the Lord can do with an empty vessel, which is a perfect picture of a lost person. You notice several things in this. There were six water pots, six according to the Bible. If you, if you were to study numerology in the Bible, which is a study of the numbers of the Bible, six is the picture of man, or six is the number of man. The Lord is clearly in the business of working miracles in the lives of human beings. The greatest miracle of all is salvation. I was reading uh, this week, and I thought it was an interesting little illustration that I read. Uh, somebody said, God is still in the business of working miracles, because this person said, I was an alcoholic, and when I trusted Christ the Savior and started walking with the Lord, he turned bottles of alcohol into furniture in our house. Think about it. See, the Lord is in the business, folks, of changing men and women, changing people who are empty and bringing hope into their lives. And the greatest thing of all is salvation. Look at chapter one. See, salvation is a miracle. 
Anyone who gets saved is a miracle of God. God has brought into existence, existence something that never existed before. That's what he talks about when he talks about being born again. Again, from above, there's a spiritual birth. Whereas there was nothing, there was a void, there was nothing there. When you trust Christ the Savior, now you become immediately upon believing, you become a child of God with all the benefits and rights and privileges that come with that. The moment you trust Christ, as Savior. What a privilege. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, to them that believe on his name. How do you receive Christ? You simply believe on his name. You trust in him that he is God who will save you. Good works will not do it. God works a miracle. If it was through reformation, it wouldn't be a miracle. But God, out of nothing, creates something. From nothing to something. That's a miracle. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Hold your place here and, and, and look with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The moment a person trusts Christ as Savior, they become a new creation in Christ. Now let me cover this verse, because this is a verse that is so often used out of context by people and what it does, and they mean well, but what it does is it just brings untold confusion to lives. Look at it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that right there gives you a hint of what the verse is talking about. It's our position in Christ, being in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new, literally, creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, most people will look at that verse and they'll say, well, see, if you're saved, then you won't do all the stuff you used to do and you'll do all new stuff if you're saved. No, there's a problem with that, though. Nobody doesn't do the stuff they used to do and nobody does all new things. And you might say, well, I've seen some radical transformation. Yeah, but there is still some sin in that life and there's certainly still time for growth. Now, listen, that's not an excuse to be lazy as a Christian, or to be carnal as a Christian, but it's talking about our position in Christ. In other words, when you trust Christ the Savior, if this represents me, and my Bible represents the Lord Jesus Christ, when you trust Christ as Savior, you are placed in Christ. You are a new creation. And now with, when God looks at you, he looks and he sees the very righteousness of himself. Verse 21 of that chapter. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you trust Christ as Savior, you are placed in Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now you have a new position. Whereas before you were a child of the devil, that's passed away. Now you're a child of the Lord. You're a child of God. Whereas before you were under condemnation, now that's passed away. Now you are justified, declared righteous in the eyes of God. Whereas before you were under the wrath of God, now you have peace with God. There's a new position exists in Christ. Why? Because you are, there's the key, if any man be where? In Christ. That's a reference to your position in Christ. Now, should the way we live reflect that position? Yes. That has to do with our sanctification, living the Christian life. And our, the way we live in our lives should reflect our position in Christ as we grow as Christians. But that verse does not have to do with your practice. It has to do with your position in Christ. This is so important to understand. What's the point? that God works a miracle when a person trusts Christ as Savior. And of course, you might say, well, I, I'm really impressed with this changing the water into wine. Folks, I'm a lot more impressed. I am impressed by that, but I'm a lot more impressed. I'm amazed when a person is born again. Under this, B, you notice that the water pots were empty and no one could do anything about it. No one could do anything about it. This is a perfect picture of the condition of the lost man. The lost don't want to admit their predicament, so they try to fill the void with all sorts of human ideas and substitutes. As one pastor wisely said, most men live their lives in quiet desperation. They don't want to admit it. They don't want to admit they've got this problem. They don't want to admit they got that problem. But that's where they're going. When things get tough, they go to the bottle. They go to the drugs. They shoot the drugs. They snort the drugs. They, they smoke the drugs. They do all kinds of things. Why? Because they're crying out inside. Listen, I've got a problem. I don't know how to cope. What is there out there that can help me? 
What can help me? Friend, it's not what, it's who. And there's only one answer, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Or they'll try to find satisfaction in materialism, and they become discontent, so they buy more, and they go in more and more into debt, and, and they're, you're being strangled and drowned by debt because they're trying to find satisfaction someplace where they can't find it. Well, I need to do something. You can't do something. I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps. They're of no value, dear friend. They're not the problem. Well, I'll try religion. <laughs> that won't do it. Religion won't do it. It's a dead end. See, again, it's man trying to bind himself back to God, man trying to do something for himself that it is impossible for him to do. You have to have a new birth, and you can't do that through works. Look with me over to Ephesians chapter 2. The water pots were empty, and no one could do anything about it, and that is a perfect picture of man before Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead, in trespasses and sins. Dead doesn't mean non-existent. You're separated. Death means separation. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle in times past, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Watch this. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Do you see that? That sounds pretty hopeless, doesn't it, those verses? Here's man. He's a mess. He's trying to solve his problem. He can't find the answer. He's going all over the place. Let me see if I can manufacture happiness. Let me see if I can manufacture contentment. Let me see if I can manufacture some joy. Well, if I just do this or do that or read this book by this guy or this woman or, or whatever, this will get fixed. Or, well I'm, well, I'm broke, so what I need to do is I need to find a way. I'll borrow some money to invest it in this guy's scheme and my, you know, my, my ship will come in. And you'll find that ship only brings more debt and you're trying to find contentment in all the wrong places, which leads us to see the only one who could do and did do anything about the problem was the Lord Jesus Christ. Six empty water pots, empty water pots, picture of man, empty, wanting to be full, but not being able to do anything about it. See, there was no question in Mary's mind that Jesus could work a miracle. She knew that he was God, and she also knew that God could do the impossible. So while the Lord said, my hour has not yet come, the wise mom that she was looked at these people and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. That's the last thing she says, which takes us to Ephesians 2, verse 4. I love it. Man in despair, man empty, man not being able to do anything about his condition, and all of a sudden, we come to grace. There it is. All of a sudden, we come to grace. Man helpless, hopeless, in sorrow, empty, pathetic, angry, angry. Verse 4, but God. That's grace. But God. The Lord steps in. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love. Look at those beautiful words. Rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's our standing, folks. Listen, for the believer, you can be as sure of heaven as if you're already there, because in God's mind, this is a done deal. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Pastor, you mean to say that it's going to actually get even better than it is now? Oh, way better. Way better. Folks, listen, when we die or get raptured, we're going to shed this old flesh we're going to shed the limitations of humanity. We are going to stand there absolutely perfected before the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's just the beginning because in eternity, he is going to pour out his grace in abundance on his children. Oh, we can know grace and love now, but folks, it's just going to get better in eternity. You think about that. See, that's what simple faith in Christ 
brings you that promise. You might say, oh, you know what? I really don't believe it. Yes, you need to believe it. Oh, I'm really not worthy. Yes, that's true. But that's where grace comes in. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved. Literally in the Greek, for by grace you have been saved. Done deal. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's not something you can do. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's out of man's hands. Man couldn't do a thing about it. But Mary wisely said, whatever he tells you to do. They did it. They set themselves up for a miracle. Out of nothing came something. Which leads us to our last point today. What the Lord Jesus Christ did was superior to anything man can do. You notice the Lord just didn't give them more of the same. What he produced was better than what man could produce. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that marvelous? See, the wine was better than anything they had had. This is not only important for the lost to realize, but it's also important for us who are saved to realize. Because there are a lot of Christians who, who trust Christ the Savior, or people who get saved, I should say. Uh, people who trust Christ, they become Christians, and then what they do is they continue living in the flesh. The newness of salvation wears off, and they go right back into living in the flesh, not understanding that, wait a minute, you are shortchanging what he wants to give you in this life. Yes, you've got eternity to look forward to, but why not start enjoying it now? It's what the abundant life is all about. The Lord himself is the greatest of all possessions. Let's close over in Psalm 34, because this part is written to the Christian, but it's an open invitation. You could apply it to anyone. Say, oh, are you getting loud today? Well, I kind of get loud when I get excited, and I can't think of anything more to get excited about than our Savior. What the Lord Jesus Christ did was superior to anything man could do. Look at Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see. You know, don't, don't fly by that. When we're excited about something, that's when we use the word oh, isn't it? Oh, you should have seen it. Oh, I couldn't believe it. It's a word of exclamation. It's a word of excitement. It's a word of wow. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good, good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Happy is the man. That's the word blessed means happy. Happy is the man that trusts in him. Happy hour, folks, is here when you have Christ. And it makes all the junk of the world exactly that, junk. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want, no lack to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. That's why they walk around like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that the way you are? Oh, things are just better for me. Whoa, I don't like this happen to me. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, happy is the man that trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want or lack any good thing. Wow. You mean to say everything I need is in Christ? That's exactly what I'm saying today. Listen, folks, you may be an empty water pot here this morning, but the Lord Jesus Christ wants to fill you and not only that, he wants to give you something so superior to anything you've ever had before. Would you today come to Christ? How? By simply trusting him. Look up here. Here we are. We're sinners. God says our sin must be paid for. And if we do it, we're going to have to spend forever in hell. It's what the Bible says. It's not good news. That's bad news. But it's true. God cannot dwell with sin. Heaven's a perfect place for you to get there. You have to have all your sin gone. If you pay for it, you'll spend forever doing it in hell. There's nothing you can do to be perfect in the eyes of God of yourself. You can go to church every week. You can be baptized. You can give money. You can try to reform your life. You can try to do good deeds. You can stop your bad habits. You can't get to heaven. So then what are we, what, what's going to happen? Well... God so loved us that he sent his son. This hand represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came for the express reason of dying for my sin 
and yours so that we could live forever with him in heaven. And Jesus did that, and he paid our sin debt in full. Nothing left for us to pay for. Past, present, future sin, all paid through the shed blood of Christ. Came back from the dead, and he says, if you'll trust in him, he'll give you as a gift everlasting life. Friend, if you're running from God, it's because you don't know his grace. Will you today put your faith in Christ? You're not promising. You're taking God at his promise. You're simply coming to the Lord saying, Lord, I know I'm lost and I know I'm not worthy. It's a mess. My life's a mess. But Lord, I'm coming today. I'm trusting you as my Savior. I want the new birth. I want to be a child of God. He'll save you. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.